This is the all new Nikon Z5 or the Z5 depending on where you're from and this is Nikon's entry into the entry-ish level priced entry-level full-frame mirrorless segment for $1400 and from what I've seen so far I don't think a lot of reviewers are being very kind to this camera for various reasons saying that it's too expensive for what it is or that uh, they have crippled it a little too much compared to the Z6 and I thought I would save my judgment until I tried the camera in person. Last year when the Canon EOS RP was released, it had received similar criticisms from reviewers including myself. Um, I had voiced my opinions from the very beginning that that camera is not worth $1300 and I had also learned that whenever I say something is too expensive, a lot of people get mad at me because obviously no one likes to be told that they overspent their money on something. But since then, Canon has lowered the price of the RP to $999 and they had a, a lot of firmware updates and they've improved the autofocus and added 24p recording, uh, which they shouldn't have taken out in the first place. And now it has become a much more decent and affordable camera that's much easier to recommend to new users. So in 2020, what can Nikon offer in this price range at $1,400 that no other cameras can? Because right now, this is a very interesting price point because all the $2,000 cameras from two years ago are getting a lot cheaper now. So if you spend just a little bit more money, you can get cameras like the Z6 or the Sony a7 III. Or if, you, if value is really what you're after, you can get an EOS RP for $400 less. And also, if you don't need full frame, you can get a higher end crop sensor camera like the Sony a6600 or the Fuji X-T4, which have a lot more attractive video specs. But if you do decide to go with full frame and if you don't shoot a lot of videos, then there are some positives on the Z5. To start, the Z5 has dual UHS-2 SD card slots, which right now, no other Nikon or Canon mirrorless cameras have in this price range. The Sony a7 III does have dual card slots, but only one of them is UHS-2. And it also has sensor stabilization, which again, none of the Canons have in this price range. So if that's something you really need, then it's already looking better than the Canon EOS R or the R. And also what I really like and appreciate here is the fact that they didn't try to make the body smaller and give it a smaller battery like they did on the EOS RP and get rid of a lot of the buttons and uh, try to dumb it down just to make this more entry level. It uses the ENEL15 C battery which is the same size as the older batteries and backwards compatible obviously uh, but it just means that the camera is now chargeable via USB and they also give you a charger unlike Sony which only gives you a cable and an AC adapter. The body design overall is very similar to the Z6. I mean they did cut some corners here and there. They got rid of the top screen and moved the mode dial to where the screen was. The top dials are metal on the Z6, plastic on the Z5, and the mode dial doesn't have a lock anymore. Not a big deal. And it has the same number of custom slots as the Z6. They didn't try to reduce that down to like one or two like Canon often does on their cheaper cameras. And only its front and top plates are magnesium alloy and not the entire body like on the Z6. But if I just close my eyes and grip the camera, they basically feel identical other than the plastic dials at the top. A lot of people tend to underestimate the durability of modern plastic and I don't think the durability or the build quality on this camera will be an issue to anybody and um, it's still weather resistant and if you open up the SD card slot uh, you can even see the ceiling on the gaps here. I mean obviously that's nothing extraordinary but small things like that can give you some extra confidence as a 
consumer. The weight of the camera hasn't really changed from the Z6. The Z5 is actually 5 grams heavier than the Z6, according to the Nikon website, at 590 grams. All the buttons on the body feel exactly the same, look the same. The grip, again, identical to the Z6. If I were being really picky here, I feel like the shutter button is a little too upright, which kind of forces me to grip the lower part of the grip, which is not a problem on most DSLRs, but this is a very small camera, so I feel like I'm always holding the camera with practically just three fingers. I have the similar problem with my a7 III, which is why I always use the grip attachment. But the body definitely feels like a more expensive camera than the EOS RP, and it also has a joystick, which again, neither of the Canons have. The viewfinder resolution is exactly the same as the Z6 and the EOS R at 3.69 million dots, and which is about 33% higher than the a7III's viewfinder. The rear LCD screen resolution is cut down by about half though, from 2.1 million dots on the Z6 and to about 1 million dots on the Z5. And, but that's still a little bit higher than A7III's screen resolution at about 921,000. I'm usually not that picky about screen resolutions, but looking at the screen side by side, I could definitely see the difference. And with the Z6's screen, it was always easier to see if I nailed the focus on my images without having to zoom in all the way. And, but if you want to be really sure, you should always just use the viewfinder instead of the rear screen because that's gonna be a lot sharper than the screens on both cameras. Overall, I think the body definitely looks and feels like a $1,400 camera in a good way. If Nikon cut down on quality to lower the price, I think they did a good job on hiding it, at least on the outside. Now, let's move on to some not so positive things, or at least what other people are complaining about the camera. The Z5 has a 24 megapixel non-BSI sensor, unlike the Z6's, which is backside illuminated. I don't know if Nikon ever confirmed this, but I believe this is the same sensor from the D750, but they have tweaked it to have higher ISO sensitivity up to 51,200 or expandable to 100,000. A lot of people are mad about this, but if I'm honest, I don't remember anybody ever complaining about the image quality on the D750, and a lot of professionals still use that camera today. But I did notice one thing that I didn't know about before I got the Z5. It seems like there's no way to shoot uncompressed RAW on the Z5. There's lossless compressed or compressed RAW in 12 and 14 bits, but there's no uncompressed RAW, which is clearly present on the Z6. Surprisingly, I haven't seen any other reviewers mention this, and this is not a pre-production model. This is uh, the actual unit that's shipping out to everyone right now. And maybe I'm missing something. Maybe they're gonna add it in a firmware update. Uh, just leave a comment down below if you know something I don't. I mean, do you need uncompressed RAW? Well, I guess that depends, and most people won't care, and most people won't even notice. Unless you shoot a lot in bad lighting, or unless you edit your photos a lot, it's probably fine. But can you live with the fact that Nikon decided to take it out because they thought you wouldn't mind? Or can you accept the fact that the images from this camera will not be as good as they can be because Nikon didn't want them to be? That's up for you to decide. And some of you might also be disappointed by the shooting speed of the Z5, which is 4.5 frames per second. Yes, 4.5. Even the Canon EOS RP can shoot 5 frames per second, which is pretty embarrassing. The Sony a7 III can do 10 frames per second, and the Z6 could shoot up to 12. And even the old D750 could shoot up to 6.5 frames per second. I mean, depending on your shooting style, this is probably not a deal breaker. And unless you're a sports shooter, 4.5 is quite usable. And 4.5, 5, 6, 7, they're not that different. But obviously, this is another clear example of Nikon crippling the camera because we knew this camera could shoot 12 frames per second like the Z6. It could probably do 10, 8, or even 6. 
but it had to be 4.5 because they had to make it more different from the Z6. And that continues with the video specs as well. It can shoot 1080p videos up to 60 frames per second and no 120 options and 4K up to 30, but the 4K has a 1.7x crop unlike on the Z6. So if you think about it, the video specs on the Z5 is actually very similar to the EOS R, a two-year-old Canon a company that's always two years late on their video specs. Now again, if you're not a video shooter, this is not a problem at all. And I don't think this camera will widely appeal to video shooters, but I don't think that's gonna upset any still shooters either. So if you think of the video specs on this camera sort of as a added bonus instead of a crippling feature, then you'll be happy with it. And But if you do want better video specs, you're just gonna have to look elsewhere. And one last thing, and this isn't necessarily the fault of the camera, but it's the Z-mount lenses. And the Nikon Z-mount lenses are still in their infancy, and some of the lenses are ridiculously expensive. And I know some of you are gonna say that Canon and Sony also have expensive lenses, but, and I've criticized their lens prices in the past many times, so I'm not gonna give Nikon a pass here. Right now, their cheapest prime lens is the 50mm 1.8, and that's $600, which is $500 more than the Canon EF lens, and about $350 more than Sony's. And to be fair, Sony does have the Zeiss 55 1.8, which is more expensive than this lens, and Canon doesn't have an RF mount version yet. When Sony came out with their 35 1.8 for $750, I thought they were crazy, but Nikon's is $850, and that's $400 more than Canon's. And their 85 1.8 is $800, which is about $200 more than Sony's, and $450 more than Canon EF lens. So even with a $1,400 camera, if you buy at least one prime with it, then you're going over $2,000. And I mean, if they're charging seven or $800 for their 1.8s, then what the hell are they gonna charge for their 1.4s and 1.2s? Obviously, if you don't mind using an adapter, you can always adapt your old DSLR lenses. But when you use an adapter on this camera, your five axis stabilization actually becomes a three axis stabilization. Is that a deal breaker? Probably not, but something worth noting. But if you're an icon shooter, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think the price of the Z-mount lenses are justified? Are you happy with the current selection or what lenses do you want Nikon to make next? Let me know in the comments. And now let's take a look at some images. Comparing the high ISO images, they are actually pretty similar up to about 6400. If you look hard, you can tell that the Z5's image definitely has more noise, but they're both fine, no dramatic differences here. But from 12,800, the differences become much more obvious. But still, both images are quite usable. Here's 25,600 and 51,200, whereas you can see the Z6 pulls ahead quite a bit. I don't necessarily think the Z5's images are terrible, but the Z6 does perform better for obvious reasons. Dynamic range is where you'll see an even bigger difference, especially when raising the shadows. As you can see, the files straight out of the camera aren't that different, but pull up the shadows 5 stops. The noise level doesn't necessarily look that different, but the Z5's image seems very muddy and lacks the definition and contrast the Z6 has. For most entry-level photographers that Nikon is trying to market this camera, camera too, I think the image quality of this camera is more than good enough. But if you don't want to settle for good enough, and if you want to go for the best, just get the Z6. I did a quick video comparison with the Z6, and at least straight out of the camera, I couldn't see any difference in video quality. Like I mentioned, the 4K on the Z5 has a 1.7x crop, and on the Z6, you have the option to either shoot in full frame or in crop mode. The crop mode 4K on the Z6 and the 4K on the Z5 looks virtually identical to me. One difference that's probably worth noting here is that the Z6 can do 10-bit external recording, while the Z5 can only do 8-bit. Next, the autofocus. So at least on paper, 
the Z5 and the Z6 have identical autofocus system. They both have the 273 point phase detection autofocus. And compared to Sony and Canon, Nikon has always been a little bit behind on things like face and eye tracking. But with the latest firmware updates, I think they have gotten a lot closer. So moving forward, I don't think a lot of new users will be choosing Sony just based on the autofocus performance alone. And the Z5 performs pretty well. It did a great job detecting and tracking my eyes and just keeping focus on my face in general. Again, I still don't think it's quite on the same level as Sony and Canon, but it will still get the job done, no problem. I also didn't see a huge difference in performance compared to the Z6. Both cameras did a pretty decent job, not perfect, but decent. But with the Z6, you obviously get a lot more keepers with the faster frame rate. So here's my conclusion. Overall, I like the Z5. I like the design. I like what it can do. Um, it may not be the most impressive and exciting camera on paper, but it offers more practical features like dual car slots or bigger battery and also the weather ceiling, uh, which to me personally are way more important than things like image quality or video specs. Is this camera worth $1,400? Is that an appropriate price for an entry level camera? Well, obviously lower is better, but for once I'm actually going to say it's okay. I think $1,400 is okay for this camera. I'm not going to say it's an amazing deal, but I don't necessarily think that it's a terrible deal either. I think this camera is worth about $400 more than the EOS RP and about $400 less than the Z6, which is exactly where it's at right now. But the only problem is, when you're competing with older cameras, you're also competing with their used prices as well. Right now, you can get a used or refurbished EOS RP for about $800, so about $600 less than this camera. Or you can get a Z6 for really just a little over $1,400, under $1,500. So $1,400 for this camera would have been really amazing just about a year ago. But now in 2020, unfortunately, it feels just moderately appropriate. So would I recommend the Z5? Well, it's hard to say because me liking a camera is one thing, but recommending it to others is a completely different matter. I'm sure there's a market for people who don't shoot video, who don't need faster frame rates, don't care about uncompressed RAW or the latest sensors. But I just can't shake the feeling that this camera could have been so much better if Nikon wasn't so worried about their other cameras. Whether you're a beginner or just an enthusiast or a hobbyist, when you're spending $1,400 on a camera, it means you're serious. It means you want to be a better photographer. It means you care about the gear that you use. When I buy or recommend the camera, I want to believe that the camera manufacturer put in their best effort and resources to make the best possible product that they can, not just some watered down version of something only to fill a gap in the market. And I know that sounds a bit harsh, but I'm just being honest. And if you disagree, that's completely fine too. And if someone told me today that they're buying the Z5, I wouldn't stop them, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to anybody either. If it fits your budget, and if you'd rather have the dual car slots than the Z6's image quality, then this might be the right camera for you. And if you'd rather have the better image quality and if you're okay with the single car slot, then get the Z6. Or if you want both, I guess there's always the a7 III. So that's gonna be it for me today. Thank you for watching. And let me know in the comments, what do you think about the Z5? And are you gonna buy one? Or are you not gonna buy one? And why? What do you think Nikon could do differently? I wanna hear your thoughts. And if you have any more questions about the Z5, just let me know in the comments and I'll try to get to them all. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.